and I, I really didn't get everybody to speak so that it would cut my sermon time short. So if you guys are planning on getting out of here at 1230, I may be in for a stoning later today. 1,023,142. That's the number of high school football players in the United States. 52,275 is the number of college football players in the United States. 13,069. That's the number of graduating senior football players who go on to play football in college. So out of one million, over one million, 13,000 are actually able to pursue their dream of playing college football. Out of those 13,000, the vast majority become red shirt freshman football players. Now, red shirt's not like Jonathan sitting over here this morning. It's not a shirt that he has on. A red shirt football player gets to go to practice Basically, they get to be the practice dummies for the first grade. So you've got 13,000 former high school superstars that are now in college getting to go to practice five, six days a week, but never playing the game. And so you can't imagine the stress that puts on those young men. I had the opportunity to experience it as a parent firsthand when Josh, my oldest son, went to William & Mary. I got many calls during football season complaining, Dad, it's not fair. I work my butt off. Dad, I don't get to do anything when it comes to games. Not only do they not play in the games, if it's an away game, they don't travel with the team. If it's a home game, they don't get to put on their uniforms, they get to put on sweatsuits and stand on the sideline for three to four hours while their teammates are out there in the game making a difference, but not them. Josh often said those were the hardest four hours in his life, not just mentally but physically, just having to stand still for four hours. And if you know Josh, Josh never stand still, much like London today. <laughs> the Barner Group, research group, came out with a recent study and they polled born-again Christians throughout the United States. 60% of the born-again Christians that were polled professed to sharing their faith during the past year. That number surprised me, I'll be honest with you but pleasantly surprised. But then the next, next statistic that they showed was the 5%. Those same born-again Christians, only 5% shared their faith on a weekly basis. Only 5%. So that means that 95% of born-again Christians are what I like to call the red shirt Christians. Okay. They're practicing. They're showing up. They're warming the pews. They're going through the motions, but they're not getting into the game. They're not making a difference. You know, I started to think about my own life. Now, I'm in the fortunate position where I get to teach next door. I get to teach in a Seventh-day Adventist Christian school. So I don't just get to teach math and reading and writing. I get to teach Bible. I get to talk to these kids about making a commitment to Jesus Christ. I get to see them growing spiritually. I get to see those guys inviting their friends to come to faith group, to come to Pathfinders. I get to do baptismal studies with those guys. I get to see them say, yes, I want to live my life for Jesus. But what do I do outside of my classroom? What do I do when my UPS man comes in and makes a delivery? What do I do when I go to my mechanic? You know, what do I do when I go to my doctor's office? 
or by the pharmacy? Am I sharing my faith on those opportunities? Or am I only doing it right here where it's comfortable for me? How about you? You know, I look around the sanctuary. A lot of beautiful faces. Better than looking in the mirror. But I'm getting used to seeing all these faces. I'm not seeing somebody sitting out there that I've invited into church. Look around. How many people do you see that you've invited to church this week? I've been stepping on my own toes so much this week preparing this sermon that I actually had to take my boot off because my other foot was getting too sore. <laughs> I see things that make me say, yes, we're different here in this church than what those numbers say. When we get the ministries up talking about what they've been doing, how they've been reaching out, but then I see other things that say, yeah, you know, those numbers are hitting home too. So why are we not sharing our faith? We are sitting on a gold mine of faith, I mean, of, of biblical truths. We, guys, we have, we have the truth that the rest of the people outside these walls don't have. I mean, is it something that the little songs say, we're hiding it under a bushel? You know, even the little kids know that we say what to that? No, we're not hiding it under a bushel, but yet, oftentimes we are. So why, what's the reason? Why are we not sharing? I mean, if I offered a stack of $100 bills and everybody that came to the front door got a $100 bill, we wouldn't have enough seats let alone in the sanctuary, but in the building to house everyone. But yet when we're talking about eternal life, we have plenty of extra seats. So why do we not share our faith more often? If I poll the congregation, and I'm not going to do that, but if I poll the congregation, I would get you know, an array of answers. But I feel like that I could probably break those answers down into three categories. The first, I think, would be fear. The second, just quite honestly, some people just don't know what to say to someone. And third, well, I'm not equipped to be out talking to somebody. You know, I'm a math teacher. That's what I do. I'm not equipped to being out, you know, sharing Jesus with somebody at the grocery store. That's not, that's not what I'm equipped to do. They're all reasons. Or dare I say they are our excuses. One of my worships this week, the author of the worship had a friend that was a cult member. And that cult member, everywhere he went, he was telling people that what he believed in that cult, why that cult was what he needed to be doing. Okay. Mike keeps waving me back this way. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm a math teacher, not an IT guy. <laughs> Are we there? Okay. Thank you. I thought Mike was just being friendly back there for the first part of the sermon. <laughs> I'm going to remind myself where I was now. But this cult member, everywhere he went, he was telling people why what he believed in that cult was what they should believe. Never, never did fear enter his mind. Through the grace of God, this cult member became a Christian. He said before he spoke to the first person about what he believed, he was literally scared to death, to speak to that person. So what changed? No fear when he was a cult member. Scared to open his mouth when he was a Christian. You know, when he was a cult member, he didn't threaten Satan. 
He was doing the work for him. When he became a Christian, he became a threat to Satan. Second Timothy tells us, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Fear doesn't come from God. God doesn't put fear in us. God does not want us to fear. So it has to come from Satan. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, the cult member didn't fear. He wasn't, th he wasn't a, threat to, a threat to Satan. We should get excited when we are afraid to reach out to somebody. Because that's when we know Satan doesn't want us making that contact. We should get excited about that. We don't have to worry about that fear. Romans tells us, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, where we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We can lay that fear at the feet of Jesus, and we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry about what that person is going to think of us. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say. We don't worry, have to worry about, am I going to mess this up? You know, that fear does not have to be in us. In fact, if you look up the definition of darkness, darkness is defined as the absence of light. I, I, I'd like to say that I think fear is the absence of God. If we bring God in, fear will not be there. So are we letting Satan control us through fear? Or are we bringing God in to make that fear absent? You know, long, long time ago, the battle was ended. It's not a battle that we have to fight today. How many of you guys, when you're going to look at a book, read the back cover to see if it's a book you're interested in? A lot of people do that. How many, how many of you guys read the last chapter to see how the book ends before you start reading? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did that with this book. I read the last chapter. Guys, the battle's over. We can be on the winning team. We don't have to worry about whether we're saying the right thing. Because if we're speaking of Jesus' love, we're speaking the right thing. So our next thing was, what do I say? You know, I can get up and talk to you about any math topic and not have to prepare myself and feel very confident. Lorenz comes into my classroom. Most of the time, I give him an email so that he prepares ahead of time. But sometimes I like to keep Lorenz on his toes and I forget to send that email. <laughs> and he comes in, and guess what? Lorenz doesn't have to worry about what he's teaching those kids about Spanish. Okay. He is prepared. But when we go out, we need to be prepared. How do we get prepared? The Bible says that those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony of God in them. Okay, So we've got it in us already. We don't have to go searching for it. It's right here. But now the question is, how do I get it from here out? Again, we've got to prepare. Oh, I hope this button takes us back. Yeah. Okay, you were given a piece of paper. And I hope some of you use it for notes. Uh, save a piece of it for later. But from our own life experiences, we have overcome major obstacles in our lives. You know, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, went through many obstacles in his life. And he wrote those down 
He wrote down the challenges. He wrote down what he learned from it. And now we have the books of um, Solomon and Ecclesiastes. I mean, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So if the wisest man in the world is writing down what he's learned from challenges, maybe we can learn a little something from that. What has God taught me from failure? How many of you guys out here failed at something? I have to raise two hands. What has God taught me from a lack of money? I won't turn my pockets inside out right now, but I'm sure all of us at some point have struggled with a lack of money. What has God taught me from pain or sorrow, depression? What has God taught me through waiting? Sometimes that's the hardest part, isn't it? Waiting. Feeling like our prayers are hitting the ceiling and bouncing down. But I bet we've learned something from that. What has God taught me through illness? What has God taught me from disappointment? What have I learned from my family, my church, my relationships, my pace group, Mark, and my critics? Sometimes those are the worst of all, aren't they? Or maybe it's just as simple as going out and inviting the people we run into to come to a function we have at our church. What's going on next Sabbath at our church? Anyone know? Okay. A health message. That's one of the fundamental messages of our church. Next Sabbath, we have Calvin Buck that's going to be here. We should all be out inviting everyone we know to be here next Sabbath. We should be able to look at this congregation next Sabbath and there not be an empty seat. We should have to bring some chairs in and fill the aisle and make the fire marshal nervous. Yeah. How many of you people know someone that needs to hear our health message? I know lots of people that need to hear our health message. So, do I go through my week this week and pray that they'll be here? Or do I get into the game and make a difference and invite them here? So in other words, we didn't feel like we were equipped. You know, I used to be a painter. Didn't know whether I was equipped to be a teacher, but I had to step out in faith. And I hope my guys are learning something from me now. So we need to get equipped in order to reach out and to share the love of Jesus. The first step is to pray for the Holy Spirit. That is paramount. We have got to do that. But on the other hand, how long have we been preaching that from this pulpit? At least three years. We're saying, we're praying for the Holy Spirit and we're saying something big is going to hit Lynchburg. And then next week we're praying for the Holy Spirit and we're saying, get ready, something big is going to hit Lynchburg. The next week, guess what we're talking about? Praying for the Holy Spirit and something big is going to hit Lynchburg. We've got to put some action with the prayer. Okay. Now, this is where I want you to get out your pencil and piece of paper. But before you write anything, ask God to reveal to you two people that he wants you to talk to about Jesus. Don't write yet, please. I've asked Pastor Mike if he would have a special prayer asking the Holy Spirit to come into this room, into each one of us, and impress upon our hearts and our minds of those two people that he wants us to contact this week. Pastor Mike? bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you've spoken to us through your servant, Billy. Lord, this is a very solemn moment. 
because we know, Lord, that lives are on the line. Lives are at stake. And each of us, Lord, have people that we know around us in our sphere of influence, people that need to know you, people who have never made a decision to follow you. So, Lord, right now I ask and pray that the Holy Spirit would just clear our mind of every other thought and impress in our minds right now those names, the names that need it the most, the names of people that will accept, will come, will respond. Lord, we pray for that right now. I pray that you would bind Satan, stop him from bringing any confusion. And I ask, Lord, that the right names will be written on these papers right now. And we thank you for hearing our prayer and blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So now, take your pen or pencil and your paper and put those two names down. Now that we've got our two names, where do we go from here? The next step is to ask him to prepare their hearts for hearing the gospel. But also ask him to prepare our hearts for talking to them. Then in faith, step past your fears and believe that Jesus is already at work creating a divine appointment for you to talk to them. Now, watch the way he answers your prayers this week. Now, did you catch that next to last part? Jesus is already at work creating a divine appointment. Now, I've got to be honest with you, coming into this week, I've had the idea of this sermon in my mind since the spring. And I pro Joel and I have spoken about it a couple times. Monday morning, I still wasn't sure that this is what God wanted me to speak about. I still had that doubt there. I get to school about 7.30 every morning, and I have a worship that comes to me online. And so the first thing I do when I enter the classroom, turn the lights on, and much to my kids' dismay, I never turn the heat on, but I'll have a seat at my computer, and I'll bring up my worship. Monday morning, the topic of that worship was sharing your faith. Tuesday morning, the topic was why I don't share my faith. Wednesday morning, the topic was how can I share my faith? Okay, God, by this time, I got it. Okay. So they took that doubt, they took that fear away. So if Jesus has already been at work creating the divine appointment. If you have those two names on your piece of paper, the only variable is whether now you step out at the time that Jesus has prepared and share with those two people. So you're the variable. And you know, it's not just whether I follow up on this plan or not that's at stake. It's their eternal life that's at stake. God's calling us. God's calling you. God's calling me for a divine purpose. Just like I was telling these little ones up here this morning. There's a purpose that God has for each and every one of us that only we can fulfill. John tells us that ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, I'm not up here this morning to judge you guys or to judge myself, but looking out, we can all be fruit inspectors. 
Where are our fruits? That's what we need to focus on. It's great to be over here teaching. It's great to be talking to people. But you know, at some point, the fruit has to start showing. It's great to be praying for the Holy Spirit. But at some point, we've got to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work through us. You know, time is getting short. I jumped ahead of myself just a little bit. May the call of God, may the God of peace, who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus will equip us with what we need. I love this quote. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the people he calls. He will equip us when we answer that call. Most of all, and this is true with anyone we want to talk about, talk to about Jesus. We have to develop relationships with those outside of the church. Think when Jesus was here on this earth. The religious leaders were all concerned that Jesus was making friends with the unchurched. Jesus said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. For I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. We've got to reach out because that's what Jesus did. We've got to reach out because that's what Jesus has commanded us to do. Time's getting short. And for all you football fans, we've already had the two-minute warning. In my opinion, the two-minute warning came back in 1844. And so that puts us, again, in my opinion, in the last second of this game. So are we going to let Satan take down as many as he can without a fight? Or are we going to get into the game? Are we going to take off that red shirt Christian mentality and step out of our comfort zones and reach out to the people that we come in contact with on a daily basis? That's a decision that each one of us have to make. And we have to make that in a hurry because Satan is not taking his time he is working hard he's working hard in the families he's working hard in the economy he's working hard at every turn that we make and we've got to counter his with our own faith when we step out for Christ now not everyone is going to listen to us not everyone is going to follow. And those are things we can't control. But we have to keep on loving. We have to keep on reaching out. We have to keep on planting seeds. We're not the Holy Spirit. We're not going to convict someone's heart. So don't try to do his job. Our job is to plant. His job is to grow. Yeah. I'd like to close with a phrase from an old Gaither song and then a passage from Matthew. Last night, I was over here until about 3.30 and I was trying to figure how to close. And I just said a prayer and this song came on the radio. And when it got to these words, it says, but don't you waver, keep on living. In the way God wants you to, don't get discouraged. Keep on giving, and soon it will come back to you. So keep on casting your bread upon the water, and soon it's going to come back home on every wave.
Are we casting our bread? Because home is heaven. And heaven's coming. And how many are we going to take with us? That's the only thing we can take to heaven with us is someone else. Now, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, we're not going out alone, guys. It's not by ourselves. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I should hear some amens after that one. So as we go out this week, my challenge to you is to follow through on those two names that are on that paper. And I ask that God blesses each one of us this week as we take to the playing field, as we take off that red shirt Christian mentality and we get into the game, that he will go with us, before us, and after us and bless every action that we take because we're doing it to show his love and to win people for the kingdom. So God bless you.